Welcome and thank you uh, for attending another one of our online events. Uh, we are happy to have Lissa Hunter with us tonight um, as both the curator of our flight exhibition and then also as an artist in the show. Uh, first, just a few words about our format. Uh, you can ask questions by typing them into the comments section and we will read them here in the gallery to Lissa as we go. Um, and I encourage you to just go ahead and type the questions when you have them because there's about a minute delay between us here in the gallery and the live stream. So if everyone waits until the very end of the uh, <laughs> talk to post our questions, we may not see them or get to all of them. Um, one of the questions we're often asked is how we select shows. And while that answer varies greatly uh, with each show, it is very simple for flight. Uh, we saw Darkness and Light, which uh, Alyssa curated at the Institute of Contemporary Art at the Maine College of Art, and we absolutely loved it. So we asked Alyssa if she curated a show here, and she very graciously agreed to do so. We couldn't be more thrilled with the result. Um, we are also excited to announce that uh, Alyssa will have work in one of our upcoming shows this summer, uh, paired with the works of Alison Hildreth and Tom Hall. Um, now a bit about Alyssa's background. She lives and works right here in Portland. Uh, she re received her bachelor's degree in painting and then her MFA in textile design from Indiana University. Uh, after many years working mainly in basketry, she has added drawing and working in, her, uh, working in clay to her practice. Uh, her work is in the permanent collections of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Museum of Art and Design in New York, and the Houston Museum of Art, among others. She is a Maine Arts Commission Individual Artist Fellow and a Maine Crafts Association Master Craft Artist, as well as a Life Trustee of Haystack Mountain School of Crafts. And as we've seen firsthand in her written materials <coughs> for the show and her wonderful weekly curator's tours, teaching and writing are also important aspects of her practice. And now with thanks, I turn it over to Lisa Hunter. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thanks so much for joining us this evening uh, at Cove Street Arts. This is uh, a spectacular place. First of all, I want to thank Kelly and John for inviting me to, to do this show and also for their support, their continuing and extraordinary support for Maine Arts and Maine Artists. Um, this is um, the premier place, I think, in, in Maine to see art um, of, by people from all walks of life and all parts of Maine Arts. It's, it's, it's a wonderful place. And as you will see, it's an extraordinary space. Um, the show started about a year and two months ago, I think, when we first talked about it. And I thought, um, what, what kind of thing did I want to do since I've been asked to curate this show? Um, I wanted to have Maine artists. I wanted to have Maine artists who work with different kinds of materials, uh, but work in a way that expresses their own ideas. And I wanted them to be really masterly at what they did. I wanted them to be the best examples of those materials. Um, so that's where I started. Um, a lot of the people uh, I already have known, having been in Maine for 40 years and having known a lot of the, the craft artists and the fine artists in Maine, um, which is a joy. And uh, so I asked them. And I also asked around for other artists that people would recommend that they're doing something interesting and maybe don't get shown as much. So I uh, put together a list of people, contacted them. They all said yes. And uh, so here we go. This is the show that came out of the idea of flight. Um, I chose the idea of flight because it is, um, it's very broad. Uh, the idea of a flight of stairs, fly in the ointment, uh, fly by, uh, fly by night, all sorts of uh, sayings that we're all familiar with use the word flight or fly. And so I thought since those, those expressions existed, people's ideas could latch onto those and, and take them somewhere else. Now this was last fall, you must remember, and the world has changed considerably then, uh, since then, and so has some of the work. So we'll talk about that a little bit as we go along. This is a piece by Kathleen Florence, who lives in uh, South Thomaston and works in the, the Camden area up there, has a, a studio up there. Um, what I find really stunning about this piece is, first of all, it's a beautiful image, but also she designed this on an iPad. And she designs a lot on an iPad, and yet then works in this large, very handcrafted kind of way. This is um, a pr a printmaking ink that is painted and rolled and stenciled onto the surface with drawing as well. 
Um, so it's a very craft-like way of working, not a traditional way, certainly. Uh, the size of it is very different than you think of an iPad, and yet her design sensibilities, I think, come through in this. Um, it's um, a flight of fancy and her, a flight of ideas, uh, and you see the rever reference to a, a butterfly here. And then if you come over here, you'll see a work much smaller, three-dimensional, quite different, by Tim McCright who lives in Harpswell. This is, um, he is a, a, um, a metal worker, jeweler and metal worker, and he uh, was at Maine College of Art for a number of years, developed the metal studio there, and has taught many, many people who, uh, who are still working here in Maine and around the country and world, I imagine. Um, he took the idea of flight and made it very specific, very, um, uh, um, I don't know what to say. Uh, you, could, you can see that this is about flight because it has oops, a propeller and it has a, a fin on it. Um, and, and it has a kind of humorous quality, which is very much Tim, if you, if you knew him. The thing I love about the pairing of these two pieces, Kathleen's and Tim's, is how some of the shapes in Tim's piece are echoed and Kathleen's, and they both have a sense of um, this uplift and, and flight that, that part of the show is about. You can see the shape here that's very similar to the shape in, in Tim's piece. And now we're going to go into another room. We're just going to go around the room and I'm going to show you the work. I hope very much that you can come to the gallery and see this work for real because the change in scale and the three-dimensionality of all of this work is so important to, to how you really see it. So I'm pleased you're here tonight, but I hope you also can come uh, and see the work in the gallery. These two pieces are drawings by Gail Fraz and Duncan Slade, and they uh, go by the name of Fraz Slade a married couple who have been working for 30, 40 years uh, doing textile work, quilt work basically, and you'll see some of that work. But recently they've also been doing these drawings that have the same kind of uh, imagery that their other work has. Uh, these have a, a sense of sky and main coast. All of the pieces they do are very specific places on the main coast. And if you look at, you probably, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little red dot here on this topographic map. And if you were standing where that little red dot is and looking out, this is the view you would see. So they have a kind of specificity about the main coast and where they are, and yet a poetic vision of that that I think is quite beautiful. Another one by Kathleen Florence. She uh, is the butterfly in the other room that we saw. This is obviously a bee. This is one of the first pieces I saw of hers uh, and totally fell in love with this, um, this, this sort of tenderness of this animal. Uh, even though it's quite large, it seems uh, quite um, uh, fragile in a way. She has a way of mark making that I think is quite wonderful. This is charcoal on paper. And this is... Um, the kind of work she was doing had some physical problems and then became, been, then started doing the work that you saw before with the, the large color areas. So she um, adapted to what was possible for her and started doing different kind of work, uh, all of which is beautiful. Uh, the fun thing about this one, I think, is that it's actually tacked onto a surface in the frame that would be used for bug collecting, insect collecting, with insect collecting pins. So she's taken the reference all the way through in the piece. And this is a piece of mine. The pieces I have in the show are, are, are all drawings, as it happens, although um, I've done other things as well. Um, it, it is maybe difficult with a reflection on the glass, I don't know. Um, but all of the pieces that I did have to do with birds, and birds in flight, and birds in escaping in some fashion. In this case, uh, this was done, oh gosh, March, February, February, I guess, and the, the uh, uh, fi fires, no, it was later than that, but the fires in California were becoming very severe, and so this is a response to that, what it might look like with the sky that was so blood red, and the, the uh, uh, birds escaping from this burning forest. Um, a lot of the work in the show 
is specifically from this year of 2020, and a lot of it comes from another time, and it's not specific to the, the kind of life we're living these days. This is a sculptural piece by Lynn Lisberger. Lynn is a, um, a woodworker, a wood carver, a lot of carving of, of, of forms and then construction of forms. Um, in this case, she, I, she showed me the piece and I loved it and I said, well, what does it have to do with flight? And she looked at me as if I were crazy or something. She said, what do you mean, what does it have to do with the flight? Her hair is flying and, and taking her up uh, out of a, a, a difficult set of circumstances in her home. Um, all I asked of the artist was that they, they knew why the piece had to do with flight. I didn't require them to um, make it very specific about flight. Um, but, I, but they all convinced me in the end that whatever they were showing had to do with flight. Two more pieces by Gail Frost and Duncan Slade. These are large textile pieces. They're quilts and they're under glass in a frame. Uh, they can be shown not in the frame, but you can see the, the stitching, all of the coloration is done with dyes, not paints. And it also has to do with this sense of being on the edge of the land and the immensity of the sky and flying up into the sky. This is by Paul Haru, lives in New Gloucester, Maine, um, and these are ceramic, hand-built ceramic pieces. He has developed a particular way of working that uses uh, a bronze glaze and um, drawings that are uh, copied and you, with a, an iron-based copying um, pigment that are then placed on the surface and then they become a part of that glazed surface. So it's a combination of drawing, photography, and clay work. Um, he originally was going to make work, b pieces that had to do with birds and quite decorative. He'd been working in both ways, this darker way and this very decorative way for a number of years. He's in a March or April, he said, do you mind if I do something not so colorful and bright as the birds? And I said, fine with me. And so he did these. And you will see that there are um, uh, COVID uh, images, the, the virus images in these pieces. So they have a dark tone physically, but also a dark tone um, in terms of the aesthetics and the spirituality of the pieces. This is another piece of Kathleen Florence. And I think it's amazing to me, anyway, that the butterfly, the very first piece you saw is a butterfly by Kathleen, as is this. And they're so different in intent and in, and in the mark making and the color uh, that it, you wouldn't even identify them, I think, in many ways, as the same kind of, uh, the same artist. But when you really look at them and you see her sense of shape and the dynamics, qualities of what she's doing, you start seeing, oh yeah, yeah, I can see that. But this is the kind of work she was doing before, and the color work is what she's been doing since. I, I frankly, I don't know how old this is, but a few years old. Um, but I think has, a, again, that kind of tenderness uh, about this image, about this, this uh, butterfly. It's called um, Crushed. Another of Lynn Lisberger's piece, she said the first time I talked to her about the idea of flight, she said the first thing that came to her mind was sledding. She said sledding is the, uh, the closest to flight we get to on Earth. And I thought, yeah, it took me immediately back to childhood and it's probably, it was a very gentle hill, but when you're five years old, it seemed, you know, enormous when you'd go flying down it and not know if you could stop. Um, so you see the sleds on the snow here, um, all made of wood, a combination of carved wood and part carving, but part natural of the wood. Um, she has a really, I think, sort of not childlike, but, um, that, that sense of the world that is like a child might see it, and yet a, a real sophistication and um, uh, expertise in how she executes these, this work. And this is um, also by Kathleen Florence, uh, another of, of um, uh, charcoal on this paper. Well, it's not really a paper, it's called Yupo. 
um, and this is, uh, it's not, excuse me, it's not charcoal, it's um, ink, or um, <laughs> crayon kind of a thing. But this is of um, um, milkweed pods and the flying off of how the seeds distribute themselves. So there's kind of flight reference in that. Another Tim McCrite. This is called Straight Arrow. Um, Tim's response to the whole idea of COVID and the work for the show, it was, you got to laugh. You have to find humor. You have to find something that lifts you out of uh, what could be a state of despair. And so his, all of his pieces have this t a bit of humor and um, Oh, not even humor, wit, I guess you'd say, wit about them. And also beautifully, beautifully crafted. Two more of Paul Heroux's pieces. These are lidded jars, but also have the, have the same kind of glazing and drawing on them and the same reference to the COVID virus. Now we're going to go into another room. I told you this was a big space. This is why you have to come here and see it for yourself. On this wall, you'll see two people you've already seen and one you haven't yet. This is by Gail Fraz and Duncan Slade. They have a couple of these very long vertical pieces. And they said they've always depended so much on the horizon line in their work, they thought, well, what would happen if we made the horizon line as small as possible so we couldn't depend on it? So they put in multiple horizon lines, actually, here. So there's a combination of this topographic drawing, again, the red dot. And it shows, if you, if you looked out there, you would see this red dot here. If you looked out there, you would see that. So that they, they came, kept the same kind of formula for how they work, and yet I think made a, a, a quite a beautiful um, um, drawing from it. And this is Tim McCrites also. You can, you can always pick his out. Uh, this is called Even a Brick Dreams of Flying. And I love this piece, because I love them all these pieces, I should be very careful to say, but I love this piece because haven't you ever felt like a brick? Haven't you ever felt like uh, you know, just kind of big and heavy and dumb, and you wanted to fly away. And that's exactly what I think this piece says, so I enjoy it so much. And this, you have not met Lisa yet. This is by Lisa Pixley, a young artist who does printmaking in Portland. And uh, this is called Know You Let Go. And it's what eagles do, male eagles, high in the sky, will um, start, um, a fight with each other, and as they're fighting for domination, they will fall and fall and fall, and if neither one of them lets go, they both die. So she said she thinks of this as a political kind of, uh, of statement, that it has to do with this um, tension between what is seen as two sides trying to um, be dominant, but if both of them, if neither of them lets go or gives in any way, they're going to die. Uh, she is a, a beautiful craftsman in terms of how she works, the, the cleanliness of the line, um, she's really magnificent. One more of Gail and Duncan's pieces. Um, and in this one, I think you really get that sense of sky. Um, when I first started talking to them, uh, Gail would say, she said, I'm not sure this has to do with flight, except it does have to do with wanting to get up into the sky. And she made this gesture with her arms of f floating up, flying up into the sky. And I thought, oh, yes, well, she knows this is really about flight then. Um, this is at Hendrix Head South, May 1st, 9 o'clock. Uh, so the very specific time and date is put on this piece. Um, this is one, they, they have done this before with people uh, that they're honoring. I don't know who the person was in this case, but someone who had died, and this was uh, that moment at which that person had died, um, they did a, a piece in memory of that moment. Um, and that kind of interrelationship with people is very common to their work, even though it seems kind of uh, topographical or geographical or whatever, they have a very um, wonderful connection to, to, to a human response to why they do what they do. 
These two pieces on the pedestal here are by Lynn Lisberger. Um, this is one that was specifically done um, in response to COVID. Um, she said flight to her was getting outdoors every day, getting out, um, breaking away from what she saw as an, uh, an oppressive sense of being inside. And when she would go out every day, she would do drawings. Um, and you'll, if you were here, you would see there are a lot of these drawings are of places you see in Portland. She lives in Portland. When she'd get back to the um, studio, she would draw on these spare pieces of wood. These were just scrap pieces of wood. And she ended up with about 50 of them and thought, what am I going to do with these? And what she did was to, quote, quilt them. They're not really quilted, but stitched them together and made this piece that she hung on the wall and said it just really didn't look right. And so she didn't know what to do with it. And she thought, I'm going to do what you do with a quilt. You put it over something. And she had a chair put the quilt over the chair, and I think it just brought it alive in a way that it wouldn't be at all if it were flat. Um, and it, um, it, when you start engaging with these images, you see things, oh yes, I remember, I know that place. Uh, it's a very engaging piece, I think, and shows a set of her skills that you don't often see the drawing. This is um, another piece of hers called White Fa White owl flies in and out of fields, which is a line from a Betty Oliver po poem. Uh, I stumble over it every time, but um, about an owl who flies in and out of a field and goes back to the woods uh, with uh, an animal that he kills, and then these are the bones of that animal. But it's, it's about death, but a very spiritual and strangely light um, idea of life and death that she's illustrated, if you will, in this piece, all wood carved. This is also by Lisa Pixley, the woman who did the um, eagles. Uh, when I saw this, I said, yes, you know, this has to be in the show. She was one of the few people I got to do a studio visit with before we uh, started staying at home. Uh, it's called Hero, and it's about um, everyday heroes who fly and take care of everything they need to do and honoring them. Um, it's been funny talking to people about this piece because sometimes people say that it looks like he's falling and other people say no, he's, he's, he's uh, flying forwards and some people say his face looks like he's worried and he's falling and I said no, 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 he's looking at something that he knows where he's going. So there's a kind of um, a narrative quality about this piece that I find interesting. What I really love though is the socks. I mean, if there was any doubt about whether this is a, an everyday hero, when you see his sweat socks here with his red stripes on them, you know it's an everyday hero. Um, again, beautifully done, very different technically than the other piece that you saw with the eagles, and yet still beautifully rendered. And another Tim. This, I think this is, um, just so funny. I don't, <laughs> I mean, you look at this enormous rock, you know it's heavy, you know it couldn't possibly fly, even with what it has to, to try to do it. But there's a kind of um, chutzpah, a, a kind of, um, I don't know, something about it that makes you say, yes, come on, you can do this rock. <laughs> um, and maybe we've all felt like that as well. This is another piece of, of mine. It's called Blackbird Fly, and um, it's drawing charcoal on a, wood, a wooden board, and then also drawn out on the, on the uh, wall. I asked Kelly very early on, do you mind if I draw on your wall? And she said, no, go ahead, sure, that's great. Uh, they haven't seen what it takes to actually wash it off the wall yet. But, um, the idea of these birds escaping from chains, basically, that these chain links break apart and become birds and, and take off, and not only escape within the context of the drawing, but out onto the wall and away. Um, something we all, I think, hope for and look for, um, and um, maybe occasionally achieve. This piece of Tim's, I'm going to, oh, it won't come off. Um, 
This is called Timocrite again. This is called Icarus Goes Solar, or What Could Possibly Go Wrong? And if you'll look at it and see that it's made with broom straw and paper, very, very delic delicately put together with thread. Um, it looks very much like a Michelangelo drawing or a, a Leonardo drawing, excuse me. Um, but then there are these little solar panels on it. This is how his mind works, that he takes this combination of a more traditional approach and then this humorous uh, uh, um, contemporary approach. It's really a beautiful piece. And this is the last one of Tim's. This is called Guided Arrow. <clears throat> guided Arrow, a reference to guided missiles. Um, and you'll see that it um, is not going to work. And I think that sort of the comment is that, um, uh, it, it, no, that this arrow is not going to do what it's supposed to do, but maybe that's a good thing. Again, beautifully, beautifully put together. I wrote a curator's statement that's here on the wall um, because I think it's important to go into a show, to go in and see work with something in mind that might help you interact with it more and have more of a sense of what the artists are trying to do. I think to tell you what the artists are trying to do is not helpful, but to give you some little inroad, give the viewer some little inroad um, is very helpful. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read this quickly to you. It's called, And Then. What seems to have been years ago, but was actually 10 or 12 months ago, Kelly and John and I talked about my curating an exhibition for Cove Street Arts. I was delighted. I talked with artists, some I knew, others I did not, made a few studio visits, and assumed I would be making more. And then, from the beginning, I wanted to include work in various mediums, all from main artists. I was more interested in selecting artists than particular works of art for the, uh, for the show. In order to create a cohesive viewing experience for the visitor, that would be you, an overall theme was selected, flight. There are so many possibilities for interpretation of the concept, and each artist began developing ideas. And then, the world changed and so did our thinking about flight. The development process was reflected through the realities of COVID-19, struggles for justice, and the increasing proof of the fragility of our planet. Flight became escape, breaking free, a counterbalancing laugh. Flight embraced the natural wor world, its creatures, and landscape. What you see in flight are eight artists' personal interpretations of the moment. They are personal in the voices and materials they use to make their work, and personal in their responses as citizens of this world. Each has something to say, and then you come to the gallery. You see the work. You layer the artist's experiences on your own, and perhaps find a place to put fear and hope, anger and delight. Each of us is seeking something, each in her or his own way. I think that's a wonderful way to look in, um, go into any art exhibit. Look for what you see in it, not for what you think the artist wants you to see in it. Um, th it's a mutual exchange. We have a few more around the corner here. These two pieces are by L Lisa Pixley, and she is, as I said, a printmaker, so they're both they're prints from the same plate. So they are essentially the same, but done with different colors. Um, in this particular one, she has put in a shelf, a little drawing of a shelf here, as if this vase of flowers is falling off the shelf. In other words, her sense of flight was falling. Um, and then she thought, it almost, when she had this one next to it, the blue one next to the black one, she said it almost looked as if they were falling uh, in a stop action kind of film. And so she, she wanted it shown in this way on these shelves um, and with this sense of, of continuity. Um, again, beautifully done and uh, does have a sense of action that any, either one of them would not have on its own. One more um, Fraws and Slade piece. It's called Flying Home. And it's a, a continual 
sort of topographic one horizon line and then the drawing as opposed to the other ones that were sort of stacked. Um, quite beautiful and um, I, I think makes you feel like you're getting out onto the coast and looking out and seeing up into the sky. A few more. <laughs> Lisa Pixley, printmaker, also does wood carvings. This is a wood cut on Kozo paper, which is a Japanese style paper. Um, you can tell that the wood carving gives you a very different sense of mark. Uh, it's very different from the other pieces which are done with um, plates, with a plastic plate, an etching. Um, in this piece, there's a lot hidden in here. Um, I've seen a couple of young people come in and really get into trying to find things and they really are delighted when they see the skull down here and this uh, skull with snakes coming out of it, thinking that's quite cool. It's called Spring Things and the flight um, certainly is this, this bird uh, ready to take off. <laughs> These three pieces are pieces that I've made. And they're of charcoal on uh, paper. Uh, again, the birds escaping, the birds flying and responding, um, not always out of fear. Um, the one on the left is called awakening. It's as if their first light in morning, these birds are flying out of the trees. This is called night flight. The birds not only are flying into the sky, they're kind of creating the sky as they fly off. And this is called break. Um, they're breaking out of, out of the trees. Um, this imagery came to me from a, a place that um, my husband and I rent on um, at Morse Mountain near Phippsburg, Maine each fall and there's a line of trees that at a certain time in the evening just before the sun sets you get this coagulation of black uh, and, and the birds coming out of it and that's stuck with me and so I've worked with it a lot. And our last piece is another one by, by Gail Frost and Duncan Slade. Um, it is um, very responsive to what's around it. If there were um, a, a fan system or a lot of people moving around, you'll see that it, it, it moves and twirls and these change. Um, the idea of walking through the woods, walking through a forest is what they were after here. Um, as a kind of earthbound flight. Um, it's quite an extraordinary piece. And a kind of an interesting thing is if, you, I don't know if you can see this sort of gold around each of the, the black images. Um, that happened when they were doing sampling for this piece in the summertime. And it was very hot and humid. And so they were working on this silk fabric and uh, working with the black dye. And lo and behold, here comes this, this shadow, not a shadow, it's an umbra, I guess, of yellow. Um, they thought that was quite wonderful. So in the fall, when they were really starting to do this piece, um, they started painting on the silk and nothing happened. That yellow wasn't there and they got, I think, kind of mortified. Why is this? And they realized in the summer when they were doing it and it was so hot and humid and here they were doing it in the fall and it was cool and dry. And so they brought in a couple of heaters and humidifiers and made their studio space into a sauna and voila, the yellow uh, appeared again. Um, what artists will do to get the effect they want. <laughs> um, but I think it's quite a beautiful piece and um, it's, um, it's something we don't see often, the sense of size and animation and you really do want to go walking through it like you would a, a forest. You want me to do that? <laughs> So that's our visit to flight. I'm so glad you were here. I hope you have some questions for me and I hope I can answer them. And just as a side note, uh, walking through the uh, silks is not... Not, not recommended, I know. <laughs> People visiting. Um, so, yeah, one question is, um, so in addition to the uh, sort of cohesive, wonderful flight theme, 
Uh, there's also a sort of beautiful cohesive aesthetic to the show. And so could you talk about sort of how the, the aesthetic came together? That's interesting. Um, I, I had visited, most, well, no, let me start over again. About four of the artists I knew pretty well and I knew what their work was like. And so I had a sense of what that would be. The others, not so much, and a couple of them I didn't know at all. And so I was, you know, taking a little bit of a leap, but I did studio visits, a couple of studio visits in December and January, and thought, oh, okay, whatever. And then COVID came, and I couldn't do any more studio visits. And suddenly, the whole job of looking at work and selecting work was done on my laptop computer screen, which is a very different sense of things. And frankly, I sort of said, okay, I'm just going to have to trust the artists. What they think was going to work will work. So the first time I really saw the work was um, when they brought it here for it to be hung in August. Um, and I thought, oh dear, <laughs> you know, what, is, what is this going to be? And it all arrived and it all hung together um, as if by magic. I, I'm sure, frankly, part of it was because I had selected artists who had something in common aesthetically. But the actual work itself uh, was a, a surprise to me how how much it really worked together, um, and I'm I'm very grateful that for that it is a very handsome show because of that I think. Um, and in terms of your own work in the show, um, so were all the pieces made after you came up with the idea of flight, or is this things you've been working on, or how did that come about? No, these were all. Uh, uh, it was very funny. When I first contacted the artists, I said, here are some ideas about flight and whatever, and, and birds. But don't think about birds. Think about all these other things. Because if, when you think about flight, you think birds, airplanes, whatever, rockets maybe. And so then um, I stared everybody away from birds, and then that's what I did. <laughs> that wasn't intentional. But I've, I've drawn birds and worked with birds over a long period of time. So I, I must say that in in curating a show, this is the second show I've curated, so this is fairly new for me, um, the show becomes my work. I'm more interested in how the show holds together and what it does and how the viewer sees the entire show than I am my own work. Um, and, and so the work I've done for this is um, my contribution to the show, but I, I really do feel like the, the whole show is, is uh, my work. So question that. Uh, so do you enjoy curating? I love curating. Um, well, so far, twice I have. <laughs> two for two, right. And I've worked with wonderful institutions. I think that's part of it. When I worked with the ICA, I worked with people I loved. They had a budget. They had this huge space. They, anything I said, do you think we could do this? They said, sure. Same here with Kelly and John. They say, you want to do that? Sure. You know, how much space do you need? What do you need? And I can imagine there would be situations in which it wouldn't be such a love fest, wouldn't be quite the same way. But uh, I think that Maine artists are among the most generous and uh, hardworking people I've known. So that if they say yes to something, they're going to do their jobs. And, um, and I appreciate that. I, I counted on that. But also, I, um, it, it is a creative experience. Uh, it's very creative to put this work together uh, in a way that I would not have recognized before. Um, and I'm, I, I, I'm a little modest, but I will say I'm really kind of good at it. <laughs> so I'm, I like having this sense that there's something that I can do um, that is um, of value and, and uh, for people to see and to be out in the world. Um, yeah, I like curating a lot. Talking sort of through the tour, talk uh, different times about the impact that the pandemic had on mm -hmm. the show coming together, both in terms of the logistics of putting the show together and in terms of the actual pieces in the show. Um, can you talk a bit about uh, sort of now that the show is all together and, and hung? Um, you know, how different is it from what maybe you imagined it would be before the pandemic? Wow. That's a good question. I, um, I think since I didn't, I think if we had not had 
this year as we have had it, I would have had much more of a sense of what each artist was doing. And so when it came to the show, I would have had a sense of what it would look like. And, and um, the biggest surprise was just seeing the work for the first time when it came in and understanding how some people's sense of the pandemic was very different than others. Tim McCripe, for instance, his idea was, you know, I'm going the other way. Uh, Paul Haruz was very much, I'm going to dive into this and use um, a set of experiences that I've had and that uh, a, a set of techniques and materials that I'm working with to express what's happening with COVID. Um, so I think if, for instance, I think if in we were doing this and starting in June or July in the midst of things that the work might have been very different uh, because we would have had this uh, a much heavier sense of, of, of the situation than we did when we're, things were just starting out. And also probably a third to a half of the work was already made, no, half the work was already made. Um, so it was selected with the notion of flight in mind, but not COVID, so it didn't have that overlay to it. And also, you talked about each artist, sort of the criteria for the, the, uh, the flight theme was that they just had to be able to articulate. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, sort of, can you talk a bit about like, what you learned from each artist's input on their conception of flight? Uh, um, it's very interesting to see, all of these artists have been doing what they're doing for a long time, some shorter, some longer, but all of them are invested in being professional artists. So they have a kind of, a sense of advocacy about their own work, which I find delightful and essential. If somebody says, well, I don't know, maybe, you know, I think, ah, I'm not sure they're really committed to this, but these people were like, this is what it's about, and this is how it relates to flight, and there it is. Um, and I guess I'm kind of easy too. I didn't require too much, but um, their commitment to their own work and to their sense of how it actually fit into the show was enough for me. I, I, I appreciated that very much. Well, it's going to be my follow-up question if you ever uh, able to push back on whether a piece was uh, or how much pushback. From an artist? Yeah, in terms of, well, I don't really think so. I, you know, I, this was a pretty, um, this was a pretty collegial kind of process. I don't think, there were a couple of pieces that people wanted to put in. I said, I would prefer this one over that one. Um, and, and so that, I could do that without saying, no, that doesn't work. Um, so maybe that was a part of it. I don't know, I don't know. I don't, artists, um, professional artists, people who do a lot of this, I think, become kind of hard-headed about it. They, they will advocate for their work, but they also understand that each piece they make is a part of a process, you know, the process of being an artist and making things and making art, so that they tend not to get so committed to any one piece that they would be you know, mortified if you didn't use it in a particular show, even if they think it should be in. Uh, they, can, they can kind of handle that, I think, the ones I've dealt with anyway. You'll notice, too, that there are a lot of different mediums in this show, and that was important, too. I didn't want to have just all two-dimensional art or all painting or all anything, so that you have metal and wood and clay and printmaking and textiles and drawing. And uh, I think that makes it very interesting. And also, I think these are artists who are using the materials and the techniques they use to say some really interesting things that don't get shown a lot. We should be looking at this kind of work more, I think. You mentioned uh, a few times during the talk uh, being important to you to have the show be all main artists. And can you just talk a bit about why you found it important or why you wanted to focus on main artists? Um, I, because I think main artists are wonderful. Um, I think there's so much going on here and so many people who are working in, um, in a way that's personal and is um, authentic, uh, is not paying all that much attention to what the big thing is in uh, Art News or New York or whatever. You know, they're doing something that I think is terribly important for an artist to do, which is to use their own voice and their own skills to make uh, some kind of communicative experience for other people. 
and I think Maine artists are really good at that. Also, I know more Maine artists than anyone, uh, than any other uh, group of artists, and uh, I haven't run out of them yet in terms of who I think is good enough to be on a show. I think we have something quite extraordinary here. I think that was the end of the question. So, Lisa, what's your what's your uh, what's your theory about technique and material and craft? This is my husband asking this question. <laughs> so, yeah, right, exactly, exactly. Um, I, I know what he's talking about, and some of you may have heard me go on about this. The idea that any object that's made, any expressive object that's made, is made of materials that are put together with some kind of techniques. Uh, or, or processes, and they then express an idea. And the idea might be, okay, I'm going to make a mug out of clay, and I'm going to throw it and put a handle on it, and it's going to be red. So that, the idea becomes a red mug, and it's going to hold liquid. And that's an idea, and that's fine. Somebody else might say, I'm going to make an object that um, has to do with um, the loss of my brother who died recently. And so they might say, I'm going to use these kinds of materials of, say, natural materials that have to do with nature and decline, and I'm going to put them together in a way that is, um, they're wrapped and stitched or whatever, and that makes an object. So that the materials and the techniques come from the idea as opposed to the other way around. And that triangle of materials, techniques, and ideas is in every object. And you can, um, but it, people enter in in different places. Um, uh, that's my theory. <laughs> but I think it kind of holds true. I think it holds true. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I'll get you when we get home. <laughs> That was a good question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Do what we can. Any other questions? No? Thank you very much. fantastic. You're so welcome. And thank you so much for coming and seeing this. And please come to the gallery. Um, there are three other fabulous shows on at the same time, and you will be amazed and pleased that you came. It's big enough, too, that you can come, wear your masks, stay away from people, and you can see the whole thing in a, a lovely reverie. So please do come.